everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Matthew Penza. I'm the Vice President of the Arlington Latin Mass Society. Uh, we're hosting this event tonight. Uh, <coughs> thank you also to the uh, Franciscan Monastery for allowing us to uh, have our lecture here. Uh, Father Nichols tonight will be speaking about the relationship between the Latin Mass and the Jesuit Order. Uh, Father Nichols is a hospital chaplain at Medistar Georgetown Hospital here in Washington. Uh, without further ado, I'd love to take it away. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much. Am I amplified? Can you hear me in the back? Or uh, what's this? Okay. Um, I'm very honored to have this opportunity to talk to something uh, very near and dear to me, um, the Society of Jesus and the Latin Mass. Um, the, uh, we have a recent photo up here uh, from Georgetown University. <laughs> 1920, this is an ordination photo. The, uh, the line of newly ordained priests there have just been ordained and they are out giving their uh, first priestly blessings. And I thought that was a fitting photo uh, to start things off with. Um, today is an ember day, um, a day uh, for a little fasting, a little bit of abstinence, um, oftentimes offered up for the sanctification of the clergy. Uh, these ember days would often precede priestly ordination, so I think it's kind of fitting. Um, I wonder also, maybe uh, some of you are here for a form of penance to uh, listen to a Jesuit speak about the Latin Mass. I think it could be a fitting kind of a penance for ember day as well, if you want to add that in. Um, so, um, the Mass, I'd like to say a couple things about the Mass itself. Um, and I begin by just saying that life is sacred. Uh, I think probably everyone in this room takes that for granted. Um, but when, uh, as a hospital chaplain, I see people expire very frequently, just this morning. Um, life is a sacred thing, and death is a sacred thing. And um, there is an appreciation um, in every primitive culture for the uh, sacredness of human life. And um, when an animal would be killed in any primitive culture, um, they would have a respect for that life. There would be a, a ritual around that death, a form of sacrifice, perhaps. Um, Greek, ancient Greek, ancient Roman, um, ancient pagan, uh, pre-Columbian, Native American. Wherever you go, you'll see a sense of reverence uh, for life. The Jews in the Old Testament have a uh, series of laws governing the taking of animal life. If you are to slaughter an animal, you must slaughter it in this fashion, out of respect for that life. You would take it to the temple. You would give it to the priest, the Kohen. That life would be taken. Something is holy in that life. The life is being returned back to God. Um, as Christians, our Christian idea of sacrifice um, is rooted in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, which is the fulfillment of all pagan, all pre-Christian sacrifice. And that is really what the Mass is all about. It's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's the Paschal sacrifice. The, uh, the Passover sacrifice of the, the young lamb, um, it was a prefiguration of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And the, uh, the Mass um, makes that sacrifice truly, really substantially present to us. The Mass is a kind of a living memorial. Um, let's see. It's a living memorial. Um, it's not just a historical uh, pageant. It's not just um, a, a play. It's not play acting, but it makes that sacrifice truly, really present. And I have a nice quote here from uh, St. Leo the Great. Quod redemptoris nostri conspicuum fuit in sacramenta transivit. And uh, what that means is that what was conspicuous, what you could see in our Redeemer, has passed over into the sacraments. That means that the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, that his earthly ministry, now that he has ascended into heaven, now that he has sent the Holy Spirit down upon us, that ministry continues in the sacraments especially the sacrifice of the Mass. And 
The same idea was expressed by the uh, Second Vatican Council in the second paragraph of Sacro Sanctum Concilium, Liturgia enim perquam maxime in divino Eucharistie sacrificio, opus nostre redemptionis exercetur. So it means that um, by the, for by the liturgy, especially um, through the divine sacrifice of the Eucharist, the work of our redemption, exercetur, is continued, um, is, uh, is exercised, is kept going. Um, the Vatican uh, document here, Vatican II document, it's in quotations. They're actually quoting from the Latin Mass, from the secret of the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. This idea that, um, that this, um, this Eucharist makes, or continues the work of our Redeemer, his divine sacrifice. A couple words about the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, uh, the, I would like to say that um, many of us have many opinions about a lot of things, and some of us are right and some of us are wrong. Um, when it comes to what is God like, what is heaven like, what is my vocation, what am I supposed to do, what is a human being? I have certain opinions, and some of them are right, and some of them are probably wrong, hopefully few, but that's very different than revelation. Revelation is when God himself communicates something true to the human race, and when that communication happens, it's incumbent upon me to receive that revelation, and, and, and maybe set aside some of my own opinions that aren't exactly correct. But that act of receiving divine revelation, what has been revealed, um, is the traditional act. That is to say, it's uh, hearing what my ancestors are in the faith are passing on to me, and embracing it, and adapting myself to it. Um, that is tradition. Tradition, um, is a, a, a means by which revelation continues um, even into the present age. And we have revelation in scripture, we have revelation in tradition. But um, that's why tradition is so important for a religion to be a true religion, for the faith to be kept, for the, for, to stay in contact with that revelation, whatever it was. So in the traditional Latin mass, this is all very much front and center. For example, in the traditional Latin mass we have Two, two big parts, the Mass of the Catechumens and the Mass of the Faithful. The uh, Mass of the Catechumens is a continuation of the Jewish synagogue. What happened in the Jewish synagogue? They studied the prophets. They studied the law. They talked about it. The rabbi spoke. The synagogue worship. That corresponds to the Mass of the Catechumens. The Mass of the Faithful corresponds to what happened in the temple. In Jerusalem, what happened in the temple in Jerusalem? The sacrifice, the animals were sacrificed. So the traditional Latin mass keeps both of those elements alive. Temple worship, temple sacrifice, together with synagogue worship, the teaching, the learning, the proclamation. Another traditional element of our traditional Latin Mass is the direction that we face. You can see here everyone is facing in the same direction. Which directions do Christians face when they pray? Which directions do Muslims face? Everybody knows Muslims face towards Mecca. If you read the Old Testament carefully, you'll see the Jews. They're encouraged to pray facing towards Jerusalem, towards the temple, towards the place of the sacrifice. What about Christians? The, the custom of Christians from time immemorial, as far as we can tell, has always been to face the east, to face the same direction together. That is a traditional element of our worship. It's preserved very well for us in the traditional Latin Mass. Another thing preserved is Latin, the Latin language. Um, the Latin language, is one of the three languages of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Pilate had that inscription written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And so it's a very fitting language for Eucharistic sacrifice, for that, 
the sacrifice of the cross. It's one of the three languages that were there. And in fact, the traditional Latin mass is the only mass that preserves all three languages. The Hebrew is there, the Greek is there, and the Latin is there. It's all an expression of our reverence for tradition that we receive from our ancestors, from our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our great-great-grandparents. Okay. A couple words about St. Ignatius um, Loyola. St. Ignatius was the founder of the Jesuit order. He died in 1556. Um, in this, uh, these engravings, by the way, they're all from the year 1609. They're a series of engravings showing the life of St. Ignatius. So if we go back to the previous slide, um, St. Ignatius, that's him there. <clears throat> The slide before. Here's St. Ignatius right here. Oops. So here we see St. Ignatius kneeling on the ground. He's not wearing a habit. This is before his ordination to the priesthood. This is before he has founded the Jesuits. He has had a conversion. He's becoming a very holy man. He's giving up his atta uh, attachments to this world. He's living a pilgrim lifestyle, begging, devoting long hours to prayer. And a very important part of his prayer is the Latin Mass, the traditional Latin Mass. Notice they're all facing, all the people are facing the same direction. And St. Ignatius was a mystic. He was a man who had mystical visions. What we see here is him having a vision of the Blessed Sacrament, seeing Jesus Christ being present in the, in the Blessed Sacrament. When we get to the language of mysticism, it's very, to, very difficult to describe what's happening. And uh, if you read his autobiography, if you read his um, journal, you can see him struggling as best he can to explain his mystical experience. But in this case, um, he was written in his autobiography is that he saw with his interior eyes white rays which came from on high and after such a long time he could not explain it clearly. Nevertheless, what he saw with his understanding was how Jesus Christ our Lord was present in the most holy sacrament. <clears throat> Here we see St. Ignatius Loyola offering his first mass after ordination. The year is 1538. This is in Rome. This is in the Basilica of Mary Major in the basement, in the, uh, the chapel of the, um, the crib, the crib. Um, and a very interesting thing about St. Ignatius is that when he was ordained, he decided to wait until he would offer his first mass. Most priests, when they are ordained the next day, are offering mass. But St. Ignatius decided to wait for 12 months, to wait for a year to prepare himself and to ask for a very special grace, the grace of being um, placed with the Son, of being placed with Jesus Christ. And so um, he did eventually receive that grace, and he did eventually offer his first Mass. It was 18 months after his ordination. This image here is a 20th century image, the 1940s, a watercolor. It shows St. Ignatius Loyola before Mass at the uh, vesting case. And we, we know this from his autobiography, I'm, I'm sorry, from his journal. Um, the story of his journal is that he burned as much of it as he could, but he missed a section. <laughs> and so this section still lives today and uh, uh, theologians like to study this section and see what was, uh, what was the life, what was the mystical life of St. Ignatius like. And so on this day, March 4th, 1544, um, I will share with you some of what's written there. It says that on rising, as Ignatius thought of the intruit of the Mass, he was deeply moved to devotion and love which terminated in the Holy Trinity. Okay, so when he got up out of bed, the first thing on his mind was the intruit for the Mass. 
That's how the Latin Mass begins, with that, that intermit, which they, they chanted so beautifully here. Um, but he had studied it the night before he went to bed, so that when he would wake up, first thought, introit, Mass. Then, while preparing for Mass, there was a deluge of tears and sobs, a love so intense that it seemed to him to unite him with excessive closeness to the Trinity's own love, a love so luminous and sweet that he thought that this overpowering visit and love were outstanding and excellent among all other visits. He has a lot to say about love and sweetness, and I gotta give him credit. He didn't think anyone would ever read this stuff. He thought it was gonna be burned. But it shows how fiercely intense his prayer life was. And this is him preparing for Mass. Okay, this is, this is um, he would spend time praying before even going to church to get ready, uh, to get ready for his Mass. Then vesting, as depicted here. When he had entered his chapel and was vesting, he was inundated with a greater flood of tears, sobs, and intense love, all to the honor of the Most Holy Trinity. So this is showing him shedding tears. That was one of his gifts, uh, the gift of tears. Then at the, uh, the introit, at the beginning of the Mass, another grace an abundance of tears. It caused him so much pain in one eye that he asked himself whether he was not going to lose it, lose his eye. At the end, at the, plach at, at the plachiat, he had a very excessive love and flood of intense tears. And he noted that the favors received before and during the mass all proceeded toward the most holy trinity sustaining him and drawing him to love of the trinity more graces that he's receiving at the end of Mass. It would typically take him an hour to offer a low Mass. I think I would do it about 30, a little, maybe around 30 minutes or something in there, but St. Ignatius, this would be a low Mass with maybe just a server, and he would, uh, he would get so many graces that, it, it, that uh, he would shed all these tears that at some point his, his, he began to fear that he would lose his eyesight. And then finally, I have uh, um, written there Leonine prayers. Um, of course, uh, the Leonine prayers were not instituted into, until 1886. But after the Mass, he would kneel at the foot of the altar, and he would offer prayers of thanksgiving for the Mass. So they weren't technically Leonine prayers, but what we're used to about that time, as he prayed at the foot of the altar after the Mass, there were so many sobs and tears, all proceeding toward the Most Holy Trinity, that he thought he should never make up his mind to rise, since he was experiencing such love and spiritual sweetness. So for him, um, the Mass was so intense, so devout, that uh, as he became older, he could no longer bear it. It was too sweet, too many tears, too much joy, wasn't good for his heart. His doctors told him he needed to cut back. So um, he, uh, he had been offering Mass every day since his, uh, since his first Mass. He had been offering daily Mass. Um, but in uh, 1555, a year before he died, he was offering Mass only on Sundays and Holy Days. But he would go and attend um, other people's Masses. His Mass was almost always private. No one else invited. That's a, that's a characteristic. His thanksgiving after Mass. This is a challenge for me, because usually I'm in such a rush to go back to my hospital or somewhere else that I don't have much of a time for thanksgiving. St. Ignatius Loyola, two hours, would spend two hours of thanksgiving after Mass. On February 12, 1544, he interrupted his thanksgiving. He was distracted. There was a noise in a neighboring room. So he got up and uh, told the Jesuits over there, stop making so much noise. I'm making my thanksgiving. Be respectful. Then he went back and he continued his thanksgiving. He later realized that that was a fault, that he would leave God, that he would uh, leave the grace to go talk to someone else. And so he spent, he spent weeks, we can read this in his journal, begging pardon for abandoning his hours of thanksgiving after Mass. Until uh, eventually, on February 25th, 
This is now 13 days later. It seemed to him that Jesus himself presented his prayers for request for pardon and accompanied them to God the Father. So a very high level of mysticism. Um, an intimida intimidating, I think, for most Jesuits, very intimidating. Um, in fact, he didn't want the Jesuits to pray as he did. He, he did not want us to have long hours of prayer. He wanted us to be much more mobile, um, much more involved, much more engaged in the world. So I'd like to say something about the Society of Jesus, uh, especially as St. Ignatius Loyola saw it with the, the founding intention. And this is another recent photo from, uh, this one is from Loyola in Spain in the cloister. If you've ever been to Loyola, there's a beautiful basilica there. There's a beautiful cloister. This is another uh, ordination photo. These are uh, rows of Jesuits, deacons, lined up to uh, be ordained to the priesthood. The Jesuits were founded in 1540 by Pope Paul III. St. Ignatius was considered primarily the founder. There were other first Jesuits. The order is primarily an order of priests, but we do have brothers. The first Jesuits were all very well educated. They were masters of theology. They had studied under the Dominicans in Paris at the University of Paris, the College of St. Barb. I, I enjoyed uh, Father Camarati's talk he spoke, he spoke to you last month. The Dominicans always have a lot of good things to say. St. Ignatius understood that. The, uh, the first Jesuits understood that and uh, studied at, under their guidance. <clears throat> the Jesuits make vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. It's a religious order. And they're famous for a fourth vow of obedience to the Pope with respect to missions. Um, when we originally were founded, the emphasis was not on schools, the emphasis was on missionary activity. If you read all the founding documents, if you read the, uh, the journals, the conversations, the letters, the idea was to be a very mobile group of itinerant priests traveling, preaching, serving uh, in the missions, especially in the Holy Land, hearing confessions, giving the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola, and um, serving in hospitals, as I do, and in prisons. The original vision was that the Jesuits would not be pastors of parishes, that they would not be bishops, or God forbid, even cardinals. St. Ignatius fought very hard to make sure that no Jesuit ever became a cardinal. Um, St. Francis Borgia is the famous case, and. Uh, the idea was that, no, this is not compatible with our lifestyle. Neither is uh, living in a monastery or serving as a chaplain in a monastery. Um, they were to be poor traveling priests. <clears throat> they were to recite the office in choir. All the, mandatory priests that, uh, all the mandatory prayers that priests have to say should be prayed privately, not in choir. The Jesuits would celebrate low mass every day with no singing. The constitutions forbid singing in mass, except at most recto tono, um, very light singing. And the, um, that was the focus. Very early on, the Jesuits were invited to serve in schools down in Messina in Sicily, and it was a huge success. In the lifetime of St. Ignatius, it was a success. The schools began to really take off. Um, they had found a blend of Thomistic theology, of Greek and Roman classics, and of devotio moderna, of modern devotion, and it was a big hit. So um, in, the, in the lifetime of St. Ignatius, more and more schools began to be opened. The Jesuit order expanded from just a handful at the founding to a thousand Jesuits by the time of his death, of Ignatius' death. The Jesuits also had early successes defending the Catholic faith from Reformation uh, ch uh, challenges. They um, upheld orthodoxy. They participated in the Council of Trent. They defended the Latin Mass, praying towards the East, keeping the Latin language, keeping all the devotions, keeping the incense, keeping the relics, keeping all of it.
I would like to say something about the liturgical impact of the Jesuits. Uh, it's a little bit ironic to be talking about this. There was, uh, there was a, a Jesuit liturgist of the 20th century named Father Robert Taft, and um, he wrote an article called Jesuit Liturgy an Oxymoron, because Jesuits are not known for our liturgy. That's, uh, you know, our focus is elsewhere. Um, but, as it happens, um, our style of liturgy has had a very big impact on the Catholic Church. First, the emphasis on the low mass. The low mass, Misa Lecta, the mass that is read um, with a sort of a minimum of ceremony. The Jesuits were not the only people to be emphasizing the low mass. The, um, the reformer of the Kamal de Lays, hermits, um, his name was Blessed Paul Justiniani, he died in 1528. He also was uh, a strong advocate of the low mass. And we have a quote from him. He says that we do not sing except very rarely. These are, these are Kamal de Lays monks, these are hermits. Another aspect of uh, Jesuit, um, Jesuit liturgy is frequent communion. St. Ignatius was encouraging frequent communion. Many other saints, many other bishops, uh, many other religious orders were encouraging frequent communion. In the time of St. Ignatius, people would very rarely receive communion, um, but there was a, a big emphasis uh, from the 1500s all the way up to the 20th century, culminating in Pius X, um, in his program to encourage people to receive communion more often. The Jesuits were a part of that uh, program. An interesting thing was the uh, third father general, Francis Borgia, St. Francis Borgia. He encouraged uh, the Jesuits to meditate on the liturgical readings for the day. He prepared a little book of meditations. Maybe some of you have Magnificat, maybe some of you have Benedictus, those little books, and the idea is that you take that home and you pray with that. That was, uh, as far as I can tell, the first person to prepare such a work was the Jesuit Father General, St. Francis Borgia. And uh, his work was not published, however, uh, it did influence the first published <coughs> book the first published book of those meditations was from a Carthusian, a former Jesuit, an ex-Jesuit who became a Carthusian. Um, his name was Capilla, and he published that book in 1572. Then a few years later, um, Jesuit uh, Father Nadal published a similar work with illustrations. If you like pictures, uh, Father Nadal was your man. Another contribution of the Society of Jesus to our liturgy, uh, I think maybe we take it for granted, is the calendar. The calendar that we observe is the Gregorian calendar, the calendar of Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. Um, we've been using it since 1582. It was uh, developed by uh, astronomers and mathematicians, especially Aloysius Lilius, who was not a Jesuit. Um, but the major promoter of that reform was a Jesuit named Christopher Clavius, and he wrote hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages promoting this new calendar. Um, prior to the Gregorian reform, they were using the Julian calendar, uh, which was generally becoming, um, slowly becoming less and less accurate. The Jesuits helped to usher in this reform, which was um, accepted first by Catholic groups, was rejected by Protestants very slowly. It was received by Protestants. They very slowly shifted over to this calendar. But if you ever talk to someone who's Russian Orthodox maybe, or Greek Orthodox, you'll see that they still prefer that old Julian calendar, which is off by I think a dozen days. It's, it gets off a little bit more every year. Um, the Jesuits helped to correct that. And I, I saw that in July, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church announced that they would be using the Gregorian date for Christmas, December 25th. So very slowly that, that calendar is still spreading in its influence.
Okay, a couple criticisms of St. Ignatius and uh, of the Jesuits with regard to our liturgy. <clears throat> the first criticism is that it's too individualistic. There's not enough emphasis on community. Why are these guys uh, privately offering mass all the time? Why aren't they praying in choir? Um, where's the healthy sense of community? Why aren't they stable members of monasteries or of parishes or of dioceses? They keep moving around. Uh, they'll probably move me in another couple of years. Um, wouldn't it be better if they were more stable? Um, and this is another criticism, is that in some cases, um, these Jesuits hold up their own institutions as rivals to stable diocesan parishes or to stable monastic situations. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of truth in that criticism. I think that um, too few Jesuits are sensitive to promoting a full understanding of Catholic liturgy. That is to say, that what is the divine office? Why do priests and monks and nuns pray that thing together? Why do we have these beautiful solemn masses? Why is the parish so important? I think there's room, there's room to say that there's truth to that criticism. And I believe that St. Ignatius was himself sensitive to that in his own lifetime. But I would like to say a couple things in his defense, in our defense. Um, first of all, I recently read an article online in defense of the low mass by James Barrasell. Not sure if I'm saying that right. But uh, he made an observation that the sung mass, as opposed to the uh, red mass or the low mass, the sung mass doesn't fit everybody's sensibility. It's not for everybody. It's beautiful, but it's a lot of noise. There's a lot of flashy stuff going on. You have uh, all these wonderful priests up there. Uh, for some people, they like it just a little bit more quiet. Uh, it's more suitable for them in their devotion to have a quiet mass. And in his article, he mentioned a few people. Monsignor Ronald Knox, Father Hugh Michael Lang, Evelyn Waugh, William F. Buckley. So those are examples of some Catholics who just prefer, for their own devotion, the low mass. I would say another thing in um, defense of the Jesuit low mass is that at the time of St. Ignatius Loyola, there were already too many um, solemn high masses that were hollow. I mean to say that people were focusing on the externals and were losing a sense of the internal, of what does this mean. Um, you know, the, uh, for example, um, in the 16th century, the castrati flourished. The castrati, they would, boys would be castrated before they, their voices changed so that they can sing. And in fact, um, some of these boys did sing for the Vatican. Um, it, uh, it was not it was, it was considered sinful. It was looked down upon by church authorities. Everyone knew it was wrong. But some of these boys would be castrated anyways so that they continue to sing these beautiful melodies in Catholic churches. Okay? That's a big problem. <laughs> it's a big problem. I would much rather let go of the beautiful voice uh, and have uh, a healthy body for, uh, for anybody. Um, but that, that, that flourished there in the 16th century. Another problem was that some masses would last three hours. A conventional mass in a monastery, if you were a monk, you might, if you're a priest, you have your private mass, but then you'd go into, uh, you'd have the mass with the whole community, the conventional mass, three hours. That is long, long, long time. And what is going, can you sustain your prayer? Can you sustain your focus for that three hours? No, no, day after day after day after day, no. It was too much. Now, Ignatius wasn't completely down on the high mass. He liked the solemn mass. He encouraged it. He just wanted a moderation. Um, he, he valued choir, but he just wanted the Jesuits to have a focus somewhere else, on the spiritual exercises, on missionary work, on preaching, on confessions, uh, in schools, even in his own lifetime. He wanted us to focus somewhere else, not to put down the solemn high mass. No, never. And in fact, 
if you read the spiritual exercises, he wrote that we ought to praise the frequent hearing of mass, the singing of hymns, the singing of psalms, and long prayers, whether in the church or outside. Likewise, we should praise the hours, the divine office, arranged at fixed time for the whole divine office and for every kind of prayer at the canonical hours. So he just wanted a proper, um, he wanted the, the inside, the beautiful inside, the beautiful grace of God to match the beautiful outside. So he, he was directing his Jesuits, a small group, to focus on some of these other issues. And um, I have a quote here from Pliny, Ne sutor super crepidam. And what that means is that a cobbler, sutor, a person who makes shoes, a shoemaker, should not go above the shoe. Um, so I say the, the cobbler, let the cobbler stick to his last. In other words, the shoemaker's expertise, it stops at the shoe. It doesn't go up to the pants. It doesn't go up to the belt. He's the, he's the cobbler. His expertise is just in the shoe. And you would not want the cobbler to give, you ex to give you advice or try to take over the hat or the tie or the dress or whatever it is. He's just the shoemaker. Um, he's a part of making a good costume, but he's not the whole show. And the Jesuits are not meant to be the whole show. They're meant to be just a part of the team. So you would say, for example, on a football team, you have a head coach, you have a linebacker, you have a trainer. They're all making contributions to the team, um, but they have to know their limitations. You wouldn't want the trainer to tell the linebacker what to do, the linebacker to tell the head coach. Ne sutor ultra supra crepidam. The second criticism of St. Ignatius Loyola um, is that his liturgical ideas are dated. It's, 500, it's almost 500 years ago. He's caught in the Middle Ages. He's just a man of his time. This all needs to be updated. We need to get with the times. In fact, what made, this is the criticism, is that what makes St. Ignatius such a great saint was that he was prudent, that he could adapt to the circumstances. He would find the fitting thing. And so therefore, since he was so prudent, if he were alive today, well, he would do the prudent thing, which would be to update everything and let go of all these uh, traditions. Um, I think this criticism is totally bogus. <laughs> uh, I, I think there's a little truth in that first criticism there about Jesuit liturgy being too individualistic, but I don't think it's too dated. Um, in the time and the lifetime of St. Ignatius Loyola, there were all kinds of new ideas being floated out there, and some of them were quite heretical. But St. Ignatius very carefully rejected the heretical new ideas being floated around. He staunchly defended the traditional, the Catholic faith. I'll give you an example, again, from the rules for thinking with the church, from the spiritual exercises. He wrote that we should show our esteem for the relics of the saints by venerating them and praying to the saints. We should, visit, we should praise visits to station churches pilgrimages, indulgences, jubilees, crusade indults, and the lighting of candles in the churches. This is at a time when all those things are being questioned, saying, no, we're going to hold fast to our, hold fast to our traditional faith. He also wrote that we must praise the regulations of the church with regard to fast and abstinence. For example, in Lent, fast and abstinence. On Ember Days, like today, fast and abstinence. Vigils, Fridays and Saturdays. And finally, we must praise all the commandments of the church and be on alert to find reasons to defend them and by no means in order to criticize them. He understood faith is something that has to be received. It's not up to us to just update it according to our opinion. If you start putting up your own opinion, well, your opinion might be right or wrong, but it's different than what God has revealed. If you want to know what God has revealed, you have to listen with reverence and openness and allow his revelation to change you and not vice versa. Um, Fulton Sheen wrote, uh, well, gave a sermon on the feast day of St. Ignatius 
in which he defended um, Ignatius from this charge, the charge being that he's just a man of his times and he needs to be updated. What Fulton Sheen preached was that, I suppose, the most notable thing that could be said about St. Ignatius was that he was not a man of his times. We today who live so very close to this world are very apt to believe that a great man always belongs to his times. It is the contrary that is true. Men who belong to their times will die with their times. If you marry the spirit of the age, of this age, you will be a widow in the, in the next one. Fulton Sheen, the modernism of 1940 will not be the modernism of 1943. So may St. Ignatius intercede for us and for our church, and may his spirit live on. Amen. Uh, that's all. That's, uh, that concludes my presentation at this point. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'm happy to open up to questions. Oh. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. I think I rushed through that article. <laughs> thank you. Um, any other observations or corrections, please, if I've, if I've misstated something, I'd appreciate being corrected. <laughs> or if there are any questions, any, anything, yes. Very much, I do think very much. The question is about the, um, the impact of the prevalence of low mass upon the liturgical reforms and the role of the Jesuits in advocating for the low mass. I do think that that is a, a very fair criticism and that I think it misses that uh, those, um, the, the preference for the low mass uh, almost to uh, an elevation of the low mass is, that's, uh, you have to remember, ne sutor ultra crepidam that uh, it's just a low mass. It's not meant to be you know, a takeover of the high mass. No, no, no. And I think St. Ignatius would have understood that. And I think uh, if he had been with us in the 20th century, I think he would have done a lot more to promote and defend. He would have recognized the need. Um, guys, you know, um, things have changed since the 1500s. We don't have castrati singing in our chapels anymore. We need to preserve uh, what is beautiful and what is true and what is good. Yeah. Sean. Could you share some consolations of your own experience in celebrating the Latin Mass and maybe tell an example or two? Sure, sure. So um, I, the question is about my own experiences of the Latin Mass. Um, I grew up a Novus Ordo Catholic, baptized as a baby, cradle Catholic. Um, and I, when I was a little boy, um, I remember one of my early memories I remember for my birthday, my parents said to me, um, now, Ricky, what do you want to do for your birthday? And I said, I want to go to Latin Mass. <laughs> I had no idea what I was asking for, but I, had saw, someone had, I heard someone say it or something like that. So for my birthday, I remember as a little boy, we went to Latin Mass, and I thought, oh, this is neat. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but then I grew up without it. I grew up Novus Ordo, and um, I always had a respect for it and an admiration for it, and I learned a little bit here and there along the way. Um, it really wasn't until COVID came and the lockdowns that I, I resolved, okay, I've got a little extra free time. I'm going to learn how to, how to offer this Latin Mass. Um, and so um, that was, a, I guess, a, a silver lining of the lockdowns for me, uh, was discovering that. It was very difficult to learn, it takes a long, uh, a long time, a lot of study, a lot of memorization, um, a lot of practice. Um, but, but I will often imagine St. Ignatius himself or some other great saint, if it's a feast day, offering a very, very similar mass. And I'll feel a very special kind of a kinship or sort of a closeness to them. Um, it can be uh, challenging to keep focused and remembering what you're doing. Uh, but I will say that I've been um, 
very privileged to offer Latin Mass here at the Franciscan Monastery a couple of times. And it's just a beautiful experience for me processing in and uh, processing out and standing at the altar and having the prayers of the people behind me. Um, my mom, uh, she doesn't really like Latin Mass very much. She thinks it's too confusing. Um, but I showed her a picture and it brought her to tears. It was just so beautiful. So I think it, there's, there's so much beauty in it that it can really uh, lift me up. Um, I, uh, I would say that I, myself, I get more spiritually out of a sung mass than out of a low mass. Um, usually, I, for whatever reason, the choir lifts me. Um, having the servers present, though, that, that whole thing lifts me up. And uh, it's an experience of the transcendent, um, a focus on the divine things. Um, I don't have as many uh, mystical gifts and graces as St. Ignatius Loyola did, uh, but in my own way, I feel very lifted up and very transcending uh, to have that experience. Yes. Uh, the question is about uh, the transition from uh, the traditional Latin Mass into the Novus Ordo and a little bit about the 20th century history of that. And I've studied that, but I just don't remember very much. I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, punt on that question. It's a, it's a fascinating question. Um, there was a lot, you know, the liturgy wars, basically. It's going to be a question of the liturgy wars where people are trying to respect each other and love each other and forgive each other with very different opinions on uh, how we should be faithful Catholics, what does that mean. Um, mistakes were often made, I'm afraid, uh, by many of us um, within the society, without, without the society. I uh, just ask for mercy, and, uh, but I'm, I, I don't know enough really to talk intelligently about that question. Uh, it, it is allowed, the question is about uh, after Traditionis Custodes, are Jesuit priests allowed to celebrate traditional Latin Mass? And the answer is yes, that uh, we are allowed to do so. Um, my own Jesuit superiors have been very supportive of me. Um, I, um, when Traditionis Custodes came out, uh, I got their permission. I got permission from uh, the, the cardinal here. Um, I, uh, I found um, my order and the diocese to be supportive of me, um, maybe not as much supportive as I could hope for in a perfect world, but uh, given the way things are, um, I know many Jesuits who do offer the traditional Latin Mass. Um, there are, it's, we're, we're definitely a minority, a very small minority, but, but there, are, there are many of us, there are many of us. Yes? So I'm gonna ask a question that's a little bit different. It's more about society, Many people I have interacted with over the years on this side. So my question. There are some people who believe that if only we could restore the traditional Latin Mass, everything would become hunky dory. All the problems in society will go away. We get those graces flowing again, and everything will get better. And I wonder if you have any, I could, I could wonder, I wonder yeah. if you have any, any thoughts about that. Well, uh, it's no utopia, the Latin Mass. I think, you know, we're, we're fallen human beings. Sin is a reality. Um, we're never going to get, a, you know, we're never going to get all sin out of our society. It's always going to be with us. Uh, the Latin Mass is maybe a, co a way of coping with that reality um, by offering something good. You know, I can't control what other people do, but I can offer the sacrifice of the Son to the Father and the Holy Spirit. I can actually do something good. Um, it works ex opere operato, meaning uh, out of the, the work done, even if I myself uh, am being petty or being rude or even a little sinful, I can trust that um, this is something good that I can do. So, but it's not a utopia. Of, uh, there's hard work to be done in many fields. Um, 
wherever there's a human being, there's hard work to be done to overcome sin, um, to choose to do what is right, to choose to do what is good. So I'm, I'm very grateful to so many people, uh, Catholic uh, laity, who are hard at work um, uh, making this world, uh, spreading the, the gospel, spreading the grace of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, not only inside the church, not only at Mass, um, but in families, in schools, in politics. There's a lot of hard work to do. I, I hope that for people when they come to Latin Mass, they can find something there to encourage them to make a good contribution in the rest of the world. That's my hope. It doesn't always happen, but, um, but yeah, I would never say that, uh, uh, I mean, the Latin Mass is important, yes, but there's so, 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 so much else to be done. And I, I know you're working very hard on a lot of these issues. <laughs> and I, I offer you my, uh, my prayers for you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I appreciated the picture of Dalton Chapel at the beginning at Georgetown University. Um, as a graduate, uh, my question is about that. Um, how Georgetown University memorializes St. Ignatius. Um, having been a student there, there's a, a plaque in the Student Center that has like a quote from St. Ignatius, but I was wondering if you had any personal anecdotes about that at the university. Um, I find that uh, he has a kind of an appeal to him um, that's kind of hard for me to place. Um, I, I support those who are interested in learning more about him. Um, I think some people come at him from um, uh, a bad direction maybe or, who, uh, or maybe an overly critical direction. Um, an anecdote. I'll say in my hospital, we have a uh, big, uh, big, actually, we have this exact painting uh, right outside my office. Um, not, not quite so large, um, but we have it right there. And um, my hospital, we're only 20% Catholics on staff. The patients are only 20% Catholics. A lot of people have no idea who this guy is. Um, some people really respond well, some don't. Some people kind of use him as a... Um, uh, as a seal, as something to, like, a, a tool for their own agenda, which doesn't necessarily fit in with his agenda. And so uh, I, I, I can't give you a good anecdote off the top of my head, um, but I would say, um, um, you know, he supports the love of God. Um, St. Ignatius supports the love of God. That might be a sort of a place to begin. I think some people sort of dis, dis, they detach him from that aspect and sort of focus on maybe some other issues, I don't know. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I, I, can't, I can't think of a really good example right now. But uh, glad you're here as a Hoya, uh, a Georgetown alum. Um, I could, uh, there's a, there's a, a story uh, that I came across. I don't know if it's true, but um, this, I read this in an old publication um, about Jesuits and uh, the, the high mass, because our focus is so much on the low mass that Jesuits often get lost at high mass. You know, the expression, he's lost like a Jesuit Holy Week, you know, it may, basically means the guy has no idea what he's doing. And uh, so the story was that there was a pontifical high mass one time, and they got this Jesuit to help out. So pontifical high mass means there's a bishop there. And uh, it changes a lot of things. I've never done a pontifical high mass. I would be in big, big trouble after really study and figure out what the heck's going on and get a good MC. <laughs> well, anyways, uh, this MC told the Jesuit, the Jesuit was there helping out, and the MC said, uh, go, get the bishop's, go get the bishop's miter and take it to him. Get it from the server over there and go over there and take it, no, take it to the bishop. So the Jesuit, he went over there, got the miter from the servant, you know, the bishop's hat, and went over and stood in front of the bishop and waited for the bishop to do something and the bishop did nothing. So he kind of stared at the bishop for a minute and the bishop just kind of stared at him for a minute and it was an awkward moment and the bishop said, put it on, like that. <laughs> so the Jesuit did. <laughs> okay, yes. Or at least the 
serious focus on the low mass when that church was clearly built for yes. the, uh, a grand uh, solemn. Indeed. Uh, Yes. Yes. Question about sermons, guidance of St. Ignatius Loyola. Um, one thing that the uh, early Jesuits would do is that they would pair off um, one Jesuit skilled in preaching, would pair off with one Jesuit skilled in hearing confessions. So uh, the idea being that the uh, preacher would be a lion. Uh, uh, you know, putting the fear of God into the congregation and that the confessor would be a lamb uh, bringing God's mercy uh, to those in the congregation. So uh, he had that, uh, that, was, that was kind of a, a standard operating procedure in those days. Okay, any more questions? I think we're about out of time. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your support. and. Uh, Please pray for the Society of Jesus and uh, for our church. God bless you. This was a very dark, a very dark talk. <laughs>